Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're, we're ready to start. Um, hello and welcome to Ferment Home Station. Uh, we are a National Science, uh, National Science Week Australia event that's dedicated to promote the science behind fermentation. Um, and today we have um, a very special guest joining us from Sydney, Australia. Um, her name's Morgan. She's an expert baker uh, who, is, who holds the title of uh, Sourdough Ambassador for Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Middle East, and Africa um, for Puratos. She's traveled all over the world learning the art of sourdough baking, and today she's here to um, share her knowledge and her passion for sourdough, and also tell us a bit about the, what is happening in our own backyard uh, here in Australia, what grains we have, what special types of sourdough can we produce with it, and many, many more facts all related to Sado. Um, thanks, Morgan, um, for joining us. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dipon. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, looking forward to hello, everybody. I was joining in. I saw we have people from Melbourne, New Zealand, Central Coast, obviously Tasmania. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here today. Can everybody hear me clearly? Thumbs up. Can yeah, you getting thumbs up, yeah. Okay, just want to make sure. So today, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, as introduced, my name is Morgan. I am the have the, actually the fantastic title of Sourdough Ambassador, uh, which basically means I'm here to promote and to um, educate a lot of people on what is sourdough, uh, also how to bake with sourdough. And of course, um, like I, I work for Paratos, but a lot of you guys at home today are uh, more home bakers, I take it. Um, if there are professional bakers listening and tuning in, um, please uh, let me know on another, at another, uh, a little bit later on and I can uh, arrange another time to talk you through Paratos products because normally that's what I do. But today I'm going to go back really to the, to the how to make some really fantastic breads. So what I have here, I have just an example. So you would have seen on the picture, I have some breads like this. Uh, we also have some, um, some breads like this. And I'm gonna show you really like step-by-step step how to make these. And we've got a bit of a competition at the end, but we'll announce that at the very end to let you guys know um, how you can win uh, a prize. Now, please bear in mind, I'm here actually. Just going to turn that off so you can hear me a little bit better. I'm here by myself, so don't mind if I disappear here and there. I don't have any assistance to pass me anything. So um, I do have to sort of go a little bit around to, pick, to grab some items before we go. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself quickly, I, um, I used to be into cars. I used to work for Porsche and I decided when I was 27 I wanted to become a baker and uh, for the last 10 years uh, I've been happily baking in all sorts of uh, baking environments, restaurants, um, hotels, semi-industrial industrial bakeries, sourdough bakeries and what my favourite thing is actually especially since lockdown is to bake bread at home. So for those of you who are baking at home, if you have stupid questions that you think, oh, I can't ask that, ask it, okay? Because probably the next person is wanting to ask the same question. So there actually is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, and if I don't know the answer, that's really good because I'm sure I can, we can find out between all of us. There's what, 60 of us here? So I'm sure we can find out um, and, and educate each other while we're here. So the first thing I wanna talk about, I hope last night, People got to try and tune in and got to listen to Carl, Carl from the Sourdough Librarian. So for those of you who weren't tuning in last night, we had a, a tour of the Sourdough Library. And you're probably thinking, what is she talking about, a Sourdough Library? That's right. Huh? In Belgium, there's a special place where there's 128 sourdoughs that are kept in a fridge and they are refreshed and looked after to preserve the biodiversity for the future. I was lucky enough to go and travel over there. I went over there on a holiday and I ended up uh, going over there for training and I ended up spending five years in Belgium. So I've just returned back to Australia and I got to work in the Sourdough Library 
with Carl, and I learned a lot about sourdough. These here are my two sourdoughs. The first one I have here is Alta. Alta is mainly made with wheat flour. I'm gonna show you, she's nice and bubbling. I'm not sure if you can see inside, but she's nice and bubbling. And Alta is actually a, a sourdough that I, um, that I got from Altamora in Italy. So I actually said to my boss, hey, you want me to make Italian breads? <laughs> I need to go to Italy. And I went over to Italy and I got to work in Italy and that's where I brought back this sourdough. And this one's actually traveled all around the world with me and I've got to feed it in all different countries. So it's had all different types of flour and everything um, to refresh the sourdough. The next one I have here, this one is my whole wheat sourdough. If you could just smell it. So one problem with Zoom, you can't smell things <laughs> and taste. But this is, my, this is my wheat sourdough and whole wheat sourdough. And this one I actually started here in Australia. And as you can see where I have the rubber band, that's where it was up to about five hours ago. And as you can see, it's ready and ready to go. Just to let you know what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about sourdough, we're talking about flour. The first half is a little bit more theory, okay? The second half, I promise you, is all shaping, okay? So you get, you get, you get a little bit of both, okay? When I talk about sourdough, what I really want you guys to make sure that you do, I wanna make sure that you all log on to the Quest for Sourdough. If you have sourdoughs at home, I would love that you register your sourdoughs on the Quest. There's, I think, over 2,000 sourdoughs that are registered on there. But you also have heaps of how-to movies. How do I give my sourdough a bath? How do I check the pH level of my sourdough? How do I know when my sourdough is ready? And then if you talk about, um, um, what was I saying? When you go on there, you'll also be able to find out other people's sourdough, other people, how they mix their sourdoughs, how they... Um, how they feed their sourdoughs, how they bake with their sourdoughs. There's really a lot of information and I'll show you that again afterwards. First thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is flour. So look, we all, we, we, we know a lot about flour here in Australia, but just to be sure, I wanna take you guys all back to basics a little bit, okay? So the first thing I wanna show you here, the flour that I like to use is Providence flour. Providence flour and malt. This flour is a fantastic flour. It's, it's grown in North Star here in New South Wales. And what's really special about it is it actually connects the farmer with the, with the grower, with the baker. So we have total traceability. Now this flour here is a wheat flour. It's got around 14% protein. And when you think, what is she talking about protein? I don't care about protein. You should. You really do need to talk about protein because the protein, if you're using, for example, a plain flour, which is what you use to make cookies and cakes, etc., you know that that doesn't really work so well for bread. It also doesn't work so well for your sourdough. So this flour here has 14% protein. So when I'm baking, especially when I'm making these bread art shapes, these decorative shapes, I like to have a nice strong flour. So that's why I use the really high protein. Um, I'm using the, like I said, the Providence flour. It is available for you guys at home. You can look it up. You can buy it in two kilo bags. If you have a pen and paper, I really recommend you have a look at these guys. It's a really, really nice flour to use with a nice high protein level. They have two different types, Lancer and Spitfire. Both are fantastic. The next flour we have here is a whole wheat flour. So you can be able to see a little bit, you can probably see the difference in color just a little bit. So whole wheat flour is actually when they have the whole of the bran, the bran as well. So Wheat flour is where they've just taken the endosperm, just the white, just the white part of the grain. This is with all the grain and the bran and everything inside. The difference when you use wholemeal flour is you might find it's a little bit different to mix, but it also absorbs a lot more water. So what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to make sure you adjust your water quantity if you're using whole wheat flour. What we normally say, especially when you're using whole wheat flour as well, Watch out because it proves much faster than the wheat flour. The next one I have here, this is actually a whole rye flour. So typically rye flour is what they use to make 
German rye bread. You know, in Germany, Germany, when you go to Germany, you see that there's like the, um, in Germany, there's the, the, the dark bread full of grains. It's really sour. That's typically when they use rye flour. And they also use sourdough in Germany to acidify their rye. So sourdough is not only just for flavor, it actually has a, uh, a, a mechanism which will acidify the sourdough, which makes the bread work, okay? And that's, that's, that's typically in, in, in Germany. But here in Australia, we also have whole wheat rye. So it's also the whole of the grain, the whole of the bran and everything inside. I saw a question just before, the two types of Providence flour, correct, is Lancer and Spitfire. That's the two different types. The Spitfire is much higher in protein, a little bit stronger, whereas the Lancer is just a little bit less in protein, but both fantastic flours. So like I said, we have wheat flour, we have whole wheat flour, we have rye flour. <laughs> I can see you're answering the questions yourself, that's great. And also we have semolina flour. So semolina flour is traditionally actually more so um, in Italy. It's what they use to make pizza, pasta. Uh, for those of you who've been to Italy, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But they also, there's all two different types of semolina. There's coarse semolina and fine semolina. There's also a semolina they use to make the pasta. Then they mill it a second time and that's what you can use to make bread. Sometimes the semolina is really good if you're making uh, ciabatta and you want to have it to dust the table with. It's really good. But you can also use it in your recipes. All right. It does absorb, it's a hard wheat, so it's going to absorb a lot more water. So pay attention to that. Also, when you're using semolina, sometimes it's called durum flour. So don't get confused. Semolina and durum are the same thing. All right. It's a durum wheat, it's the type of wheat. There's also other flours, of course, you have uh, here in Australia, of course, we have spelt flour, you see a lot of that. Now, spelt flour is, is actually quite expensive, just so you know, it's actually quite an expensive flour because it can only be grown in certain climates. It's also got a much lower gluten inside, so it's, a, it's actually, Pretty good to use. I don't find a difficulty using it, but sometimes some people find it a little bit sticky, like a rye, because it's actually much lower in gluten. So now we've covered flour. We've talked about sourdough. We've talked about flour. I'll come back to your questions at the end, if that's all right. I just want to keep rocking and rolling, because I know you all want to see how to make some shapes. I'm going to show you guys something really special. So for those of you who are playing along at home, Something that's really, we're really lucky here in Australia, we actually have a lot of different whole grains, okay? So basically we need to have, um, sorry, basically here in Australia, you have access to some fantastic type of grains. So here I have some Australian black barley, all right? We have some roasted farro. So these are really nice whole grains and you're wondering like, how, how am I gonna use it? Do I just add it straight in the dough? No, that's where this little guy comes in handy. This is my new friend. Um, finally, I, um, I've been using them for the last couple of years, but finally I have one here in the office here in Sydney. It's called a mock meal. This gives you, and this is available to be bought, bought um, at home. Uh, there's a company in Melbourne called Van Roy, Van Roy Machinery, and they actually import, this is a little logo, yeah, <laughs> they actually import the, these in, okay? And they're, they're really good for the home baker. It's also really good for your sourdough as well. You can really like, you can mill your own grains to feed your own sourdough at home and make something really special. So I'm just gonna show you how easy it is to use because today I've actually used it in some of my recipes. So what I have here, just some whole grains, really. It's just this easy. You're just going to pour them inside. All right, you just pour them in. And you can source the grains from your local ingredient store. It's going to make a little bit of noise, so sorry for that. And 
what's great about it is you can adjust the, the also, the name of the mill is called Mock Mill. M-O-C-K-M-I-L-L 100. That's right. So Mock Mills, that's well up. Chris, Chris has actually answered the question there for you. The Mock Mills come from Germany, from Wolfgang Mock Mill. And um, they're really, they're here now, they're importing them into Australia through Van Roy in Melbourne. And I really think you should get hold of one. So as you can see here, it really mills it super fine. So you saw these grains are like proper grains. I'm gonna show you what they, what they look like. They're beautiful, I really like them. I like the bag too. So as you can see here, they're actually black grains. And here, like you can see, it's milled it straight into the, into flour for me. So these are something that's really handy for, especially if you're a home baker, I cannot recommend them high enough because you can really have some fun and play around with them. And like I said, you can get hold of some, some black barley, some roasted farro. Sure, I'll get back to that one if that's okay. There's no question about sprouted grains. I'll get back to you on that one. So like I said here, I would, when, I've, when I'm making these, the recipes I made today, I did use the mock meal. I used some black barley inside. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit afterwards about that one. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is spent grains. Now, who out there likes beer? Dipon, you guys? You like beer? You still with us? Yeah, we're here, of course. We brew, uh, we do home brewing. Ah, voila. Mm -hmm. So you have some spent grains then? Um, not always all grain brewing. We do it from kits and mix it a bit, but yeah, we can have spent grains. Okay. And I hope a couple of the guys out there as well, I hope you've got, maybe you've got a local brewery that you like. Um, thumbs up for home brewing, voila. Yes to beer, voila. I think I've got everyone excited here. Well, I'm not gonna make beer today, unfortunately. That's, <laughs> that's for next time. But no, what we're gonna do here is what I did is I went down to my local brewery. I went down to the brewery down in Manly, so I'm from the, um, in Sydney. Went down to Four Pines. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Four Pines before. And they were making this like red ale. So, can I please get some of the grains? And in here we have caramunic, we have roasted barley, I have some ale malt, and it's just like it's grains ready to go, soaked, ready for you. So, and it's a really nice way because then I took the grains, I went back, I bought the brewer some bread, and what do you think I also got as a thank you? some beer. <laughs> so it actually, it's a really nice way of connecting. So like I explained to you here, I know from the flour, I know the grower, I know the miller, I have a full connection. Now I know the brewer. So we have a really nice connection um, with all the, these, you know, we're all in the industry and everybody loves beer and everyone loves bread. Now, when you're using spent grains, it's important that you need to keep them refrigerated. So if you do go down the brewer, ask them for your, their leftover grains. I, I suggest that you put them in a sealed bag. You can freeze them. You don't want to use them straight away. I had a 25 kilo bag, so I didn't need all of them. So what I did is I actually put them in a Ziploc and I put them into the freezer. And then I have some here. And also the other thing you can do, you can actually pour them on a tray. Once you pour them on a tray, you can then put them in the oven at 80 degrees and you can dry them out. So put them in the oven at 80 degrees, dry them out, and then you can mill them and you actually end up with the flour. So this is actually, I turned these grains into this flour just by drying them out and putting them through the mock mill. So really, you can also use them directly in your dough. I made a mash, I mixed some, I put them with my sourdough, I put them together and I made like a spent grain mash. Uh, and that really works well as well. So there's all different opportunities. So really try, try and think a little bit outside the box. That's what I'm here for, bring you guys some inspiration and to sort of explain to you a little bit about it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain to you how simple, how to mix a sourdough bread. Okay, very simple. 
Ah, I've done great breads. Thank you, Jose. It's exactly right. So go down and connect to your local brewer and uh, say you'll bring them some bread if you can get some grains and you might even get some beer. Works well. So here I have a very simple recipe for sourdough. Really, really, really simple. Now, as a baker, we work in baker's percentages. You probably think, hey, what, do you, what do you mean by 100% flour? If you have one kilo of flour in baker's percentages, that's 100% flour. Here, I have one kilo flour. I have 20 grams of salt. That is 2% salt. Then, for example, I have honey. So this honey I have here, I have around 20 grams of honey. That also would be 2%, 2% honey. Honey I like to put in for a little bit of sweetness. It is optional, it is completely up to you. I don't use any sugar or any fat in my recipes, but I do like a little bit of sweetness from the honey. Here was my flour, by the way, my 100% one kilo flour. Now, just to come back on this quickly before I talk about water, when you're using the flour, you can mix. You don't have to use 100% of the, of the wheat flour. You can mix and match. You can use 50-50. You can use 50% whole wheat, 50% white flour. You can use 50% semolina, 50% wheat flour. You can reduce. You can go, for example, 80% wheat flour, 10% rye flour, and 10% whole wheat flour. As long as it equals 100%, it's okay. Some people work in different percentages. Some people use the sourdough. I add the sourdough on top. So for example, I'm gonna make it quite clear for you. Here is one kilo of flour. Here is 20 grams of salt. Here is 20 grams of honey. I also will add inside my sourdough. But people ask me, how much sourdough should I put in? It's really up to you. You can, you can choose how much sourdough. Obviously, the more sourdough, the more fermentation. The faster the fermentation as well. Also, it might be the, the richer the flavor. So, for example, here, When I normally mix, I like to work with 20% sourdough. So what that means for one kilo of flour, I use 200 grams of sourdough. And also to make sure your sourdough is ready. Like Carl spoke about last night, if you tuned in, you can check your pH level, but not all of us have pH testers lying around. So what I normally go by is there's two options. The first one is you can watch when it comes to its peak. So that means when you fed it, it's normally around eight hours, okay? And basically what happens if it comes up after eight hours, you start to see it reaches its peak and it will start to drop down again. So see how you can see on the top here, it started to drop down already. I recommend using your, using your sourdough around just after eight hours, between eight to 10 hours after feeding it. But you know your child, okay? I'm not gonna tell you how to, if you've been baking with sourdough, I'm not gonna tell you how to change it, but this is just what works for me. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put in 200 grams of my sourdough. And I'm also gonna put in the water here. And this is when I'll make an auto lease. So I have a mixer, luckily for me. But what I would do is I would make an auto lease here, just the flour, the sourdough and the water. I leave it, an auto lease is where you mix it for about one minute, two minutes, just until it's a little bit, uh, the water's absorbed, and then you leave it for about one hour. After one hour, you then add the salt and the honey and whatever else you wanted to add inside, and then you do the final mixing. Just wanna quickly talk to you a little bit about hydration. So when you're mixing bread, you can choose your water hydration. I normally, for sourdough, use around 75 to 80% water. If the less water you do, look, sorry, the less water you use, the more closed your crumb. 
the more water you use, the more open your crumb, but also sometimes the more difficult to handle. For example, yeah, I just mentioned the water now. So for example, when you're, yeah, so around 75, to, yeah, so, uh, yep, if with order leaves, you can do it with the leavening, without the leavening. Some people do it with the salt, without the salt. It's really totally up to you. I like to put the leavening inside when I do my order leaves. But as I said, it's everybody, for, everybody can choose their own way. I find it with the order leaves that it works better for me. With the order leaves, sourdough in the order leaves works better for me. When you're working with the water, like I said to you, typically a toast bread, a toast bread will have around 50, 50% hydration. Uh, a typical baguette will have around 68% hydration. But remembering that your sourdough also has water inside, so pay attention to that. If you're using spent grains, be careful because there's also water inside those when you're baking, so pay attention to that. If you wanna make a ciabatta, that's around 80% water. You can go all the way up to 100% water if you're game. Dip on, if you like. You wanna make a bread with 100% water? No, you can. Don't, don't be shy. You just need to add it really, really slowly. Very too difficult. I'm very bad with bread handling, so... Well, uh, yeah, I mean, won't even try. <laughs> well, it is possible. So to answer the question, the weight of the water, if you have one kilo flour, 200 grams of sourdough, 20 grams of salt, 20 grams of honey, your water can be around 650 grams to 700 grams. But it will also depend on your flour and your mixing. If you're mixing by hand, of course, it's going to be a little bit more challenger, challenging than if you're actually mixing with a, a KitchenAid, for example. So I'm not going to show you the mixing today because that's not what it's about. You're here to learn some shapes, yeah? You're here to learn about how to shape some bread. I need to make a little bit of space for myself. You can just stay with me for a second. Just gonna move these away so I can make some room so I can show you guys how to make some bread. Alrighty. So the first thing you're gonna need when you are doing decoration bread. So I have some dough here. Actually, yeah, that's fine. I have some dough here. So after you've mixed your dough, especially with sourdough, it's important that you leave it for, sorry, is there a question, Dipon? You can interrupt me if you need to. So uh, if, if someone increases or decreases the percentage of the starter in the recipe, other ingredients won't change? No, just the time and the water maybe. So if you're, if you're for example, when you put 200 grams of starter inside a recipe, half of that is water. Okay, so therefore, if you half your starter, you might need to increase your water. Does that make sense to you? But the other parts of the recipe shouldn't, it's normally based on the flour. Personally, don't base yet. As I said, everybody to their, every, everyone to themselves. You can base the salt on the flour. You can base it on your taste. Every country has different salt legislations. For example, here in Australia, we have a, quite a high salt level, okay? We can put up, to, you know, quite a high amount of salt. Whereas if you go to England, it's a very low, even Finland, it's even half. So I'm not gonna tell you, that's, that's personally my recipe where I put 20 grams per one kilo of flour. If I'm making ciabatta and I'm gonna use 80% water, I'll go even higher in salt, okay? Uh, can you make your own starter? Of course. But we'll come back to that. I've got a whole YouTube channel on how to make your own sour, sour, sourdough. That's another whole hour. <laughs> we'll do that one. We'll talk about that one later on. But basically, once you've mixed your dough, you'll need to leave it for two or three hours till it doubles in size. Then once it doubles in size. Now, with these recipes that I'm showing you today as well, with the recipes I'm showing you today, you can do these recipes with, with yeast, okay, of course. I personally don't like to work with yeast, but you can make these recipes with yeast as well, and you just need to change your times. So what I'm gonna do now, 
is I'm going to show you really simply. Couple of, a couple of ways to, to make some different types of shapes. So I have a question for you guys. How many grams do you think is in a baguette? How many grams in a typical baguette? A typical French baguette? Anybody want to guess? 350, 360, Andy, 300, 180, 250. Oh, we've got some good guesses out there. A typical French baguette is between 360 to 380. That is correct. Then we have also, for example, a batar. A typical a loaf of bread could be anywhere from 300 to 600, anywhere up to a miche, which can be, you know, the big 1.2 kilos. Then you have a bread roll, which can be like 80 grams, 60, 80, even 100 grams. So it's really different. I'm not uh, per country, per uh, per bakery even. Yeah. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to show you guys something. When you're doing the pre-shaping, especially for baguettes. Now I can get you can switch to the other one if you like, but it's just for this one. It's fine. When you're doing baguettes, I just like to make them long first. Thanks, mum. That's my mum commenting. Hi, mum. <laughs> She's correcting me. Sorry if my mum corrects me during this presentation. <laughs> She's been learning. She's a good, good student. When you're making the, um, the baguettes here, it's important when you're doing the pre-shaping, this is the pre-shaping, that I make the baguettes quite long when I'm doing already doing the pre-shaping like this. Okay? So you can uh, see here. Yep. Morgan, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you turn on the video of your other camera when you are ready? Ah, sure, no problem. I'll just go around and do that. <laughs> Sorry. One second. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, Yep, you're... Oh, no. Okay. It's gone again? Yeah, I'm going again, one second. Yeah, technical issues, that's uh, normally... Yeah, hold on one second. <laughs> All right, now we should be on. Yep, it's on. Okay. Oh, it's the ceiling. Uh, okay. There we go. Yeah. I have low battery, so I have to be quick on that one. I'll probably have to uh, change over. But when you, what I'm trying to say to you is basically when you make a baguette, it's important that you make it long like this. Okay, that's the pre-shape. Now I have some already ready. So normally you know that you have to rest things. The most important ingredient in baking is time. All right, so what I have here, I have some that I've already been resting for half an hour. Okay, so you should be able to see here, I have some that I've already been resting. This is the simplest way to make a baguette. You can see me, hear me, everything's okay. Yeah, and so basically when you make a baguette, there's, there's different ways. The French way, they taught me like this, you just fold from the top to the middle like so, then you turn it around and you go from the bottom to the middle. Yeah, 
Now, when you're making a baguette, it's really important. You don't need so much flour, okay? I'm just letting you know. Then we're gonna do, we're gonna close it, all right? So when we close it, I'm gonna put my thumb, I'll turn it around here. I put my thumb here and I'm gonna close it with the other, okay, here we go. I put my thumb and I close it like so. All right? Then you roll it out. But like I said, you don't need all this flour. You're gonna roll it out. You're putting a bit of pressure, and when you put pressure on the ends, that's what's gonna form the point at the end. I'm gonna go through and do the next one. So we stretch it out a little bit. You go the top to the middle. Okay, you turn it around. And then the top to the middle again, like so. And then you use your thumb like you're surfing the wave, okay? This other hand is gonna pull it over and I close it with the bottom of my hand here, okay? So I close it with the bottom of my hand here, like so. And then like this, okay? So that's the easy way to make a baguette. There's also other ways. Just put a little bit of flour on the table, it's a little bit sticky on top. There is, if it's, that's a bit too difficult for you, the other way as well, you can just fold it down like so. So you start from the top, you fold it down and you go again. You fold it down, you go again, you fold it down and then you close it with the back of your hand. Okay, and see how I'm, when I'm rolling it, I start from the middle and I'm pushing with my hands going out like so, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'll just do it one more time for you. And eventually you should have to go quite fast. And you close like this. So I hope you practice this tonight, Diplom. And mum, if you're watching still. <laughs> so when you're doing this, you just need to, you make your baguette slow. So while I'm here, I'm gonna show you another basic one. This is the basic one. Just remember, I'm showing you the basics and then we're gonna warm up and we're gonna get more and more complicated as we go. Don't worry, we still have another 20 minutes. So here, I always start with the ugly side facing up, okay? So this is what's called the ugly side. This is called the beautiful side, okay? The ugly side facing up. Now I just fold the top like so. I fold the corners in. And then again, this is a simple way to shape. And then I close. Like I said, sometimes it's easier to work with less flour. And then when you're rolling, you're just rolling back and forth, back and forth, just to seal it. And you can even push down a little bit harder on the sides. That will give you the point on the ends. I'm gonna do that again for you. Like so. Then, like so. And then I give the points on the end. Now these are really simple ways to make it. What I wanna show you now, when you put baguettes on a tray, you can put them facing up. You can put them facing with the seam facing up. It's totally up to you, but just remember which way you put them on the, on the cush. So you just put, this is a quarter cush here. I go like so. Then I have another one like so. Then if you also with these ones, it's the same thing. You can put them facing up, but I wouldn't put them together because like penguins, when penguins get really hot, they grow really fast. So give it a bit of space. So here, I put the other one here. So see how I've spaced it out? Then just give them a little bit of room. 
And it's also important, if possible, if you can actually just put some plastic on top and then this over the top as well. The plastic is going to help it protect it from drying out. So that's the first one, very simple. But now we're going to get a little bit more complicated, you could say. Here, what you can also do with baguettes, all right, is you can actually make it like an S shape. And you're going to see, I'm going to show you guys how to make this dragon. Okay? So we're just going to make it like an S shape on the tray, like so. You can roll it in seeds. I've rolled this one in poppy seeds. Also good if you just put a little bit of flour on your tray to stop it from sticking. The dough's a bit sticky. And you're going to go like so. All right? So you have the two on the tray like this. It looks really good. Yeah? Yeah. It looks like yeah. a dragon. We have some that I prepared earlier. <laughs> like so. These ones have actually already been proving. These ones are ready to go. What you want to ask, I'm just going to plug in my iPhone just for charge. Change video, I think. I just need to charge my, my phone. One second, guys. No problem. We can switch your video back to normal. <laughs> I can't see much. But yeah, I mean, so far, it's, it looks really great. I mean, what you have prepared and how they've Final product look. I mean, um, I'm yeah, gonna I'm try ready, that tonight. Yeah, ready Not to tonight, challenge but... myself. Uh, unfortunately, my iPhone is uh, was fully charged, but in the five minutes since we've been on this thing, it's decided to be empty. <laughs> so I'm back now. Are we okay? Yeah, yep. all good. All good. Switching over. Right. So, like I said here, you have the two uh, breads. These ones are already fully proved, ready to go. And you know what? You know all you need is scissors. Really easy. We're going to use scissors. I'm also going to make it a little bit more fun. I'm going to show you guys a little bit about stenciling, okay? So the stencil is here. I buy these stencils just from Spotlight. You can order them online. They're usually for arts and crafts. People think I'm a bit crazy when I use them for bread. Can yes. you? I'm just going to place the stencil. So cool. Sorry? You're laughing at me, were you, Dipon? No, that is so cool. <laughs> just making yourself, but really it's... If you go into the arts and crafts section, you'll find them there. I use tea strainers as my sifter. Okay, it's a tea strainer. So I'm sure your mum has one of these at home somewhere. Be sure to, if something's going to go missing tomorrow, you can blame me. And we're just going to tap. I don't like to shape. I always like to tap and I use rye flour. So when I'm decorating, I like to use the rye flour rather than the white flour because I find the rye flour gives a nicer colour on the bread. So I'm just going to put them on top, lift it off quite gently. And you should see it here like so. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it. So using the scissors, it's better to have scissors with a nice point on it. You're, you're aiming your scissors on an angle and you chop. Chop, chop, okay? Just like so. And when you get to a certain point, you can change and go the other way. Did you see that? I do it again. So I'm snipping quite fast and I'm giving like a one or two centimeters in between. And then you can come and you can move them as you go. 
what do you do if you snip off the entire bread? Because that's what I'm going to do. You have to keep yourself like a little, a little, little millimeter from the bottom. So and you know, just, you'll be practice. You'll be fine. I promise. Yeah. Try right. again. These ones we're going to bake. But in a minute, they're going to have a friend to bake with them. So we have these. Now, I have something else I want to show you. See these ones here? Nice. Oh. Yeah, it's a really simple design, guys. This one is much, is really not so complicated, just like that one I showed you then. So you just need two rounds. Okay, these have been resting. What you're gonna do is you're gonna make them round. I'm gonna show you the easy way just to make it round, just like you're driving a car, okay? Just make it nice and round. You don't need to make them too tight. Okay, so just like so. And then you're gonna use a rolling pin and flour. All right. Um, yeah, the farina I use, yeah, the flour I use is rye, rye or integral. That's correct, yes. They're asking me the questions in French. <laughs> All right, so here what we're gonna do, we put flour on top. For this one, flour is your friend, okay? Thank you, Marco. And then what you're gonna do here is we're gonna put the rolling pin. We don't need to put it all the way in the middle. We're just gonna put a little bit first. This one is called a tabitier, which is actually French, traditional French bread. I am not French, but I have been trained in France. So that's okay, right? And I spent five years living in Belgium, so my French is okay. Ça va. Je comprends, je comprends. But basically here, you're just rolling it out. You're just putting pressure just on the top here to see how this is still quite big and just the bottom is being rolled out. So you're just pushing it out. Do the same thing with this one. Once again, flour is your friend. If you don't put flour on it, it's going to stick to your rolling pin and it's going to drive you crazy, all right? So you're just rolling it out. If you find it's difficult, like this one, you can just come back afterwards and you'll find that when you leave it for a couple of seconds, you come back, it's going to roll out more. So here, the same. Pick it up, put it in the flour if you need to, and just keep rolling. You have to use a bit of pressure. I do travel everywhere with my, my rolling pin. Just so you know, this rolling pin is from Spotlight. It's a fantastic rolling pin. If you see it in Spotlight, I do recommend you grab it. It's really good for bread. All right, so now we have these two here, like so. Then I suggest you dust off the flour and you're gonna use some olive oil. So this is the olive oil I have here. And the olive oil, I'm just going to put just on the outsides, so just around the top here. And then the hardest part about it is that. You think you guys can do that one at home? This one I can do too. Ah, that's what I like to do. That's the spirit. So what you're going to do, is you then need to put it onto a tray. But what I reckon, when you put it on the tray, you need to put it face down. See what I'm doing? See how I put it down? And then just before baking, we're going to turn it the other way. And that top is going to lift off. So I've got some that I prepared earlier. I've been quite busy for you guys today. <laughs> you, you can see down, that. I know we're getting to the end of time, but if you guys can stay around for a couple of extra minutes, I can keep going with some more shapes, so. Yeah, you can go, can go in as long as you need. Do you want to introduce the competition before the time ends? Oh, uh, people have to leave, they can still hear about it? Yep, so do you want to put me uh, on the big screen? Yep. Uh, 
So for all these shapes that I'm making today, once we're finished, if you can, if you've got the Facebook, you've got the Fermented Home um, who, who have promoted this event, or you've got myself, so you have me here. I've got my Instagram here, Morgan the Sourdough Baker. It's quite easy. Or on my on Facebook. So Fermented Home um, or, the, uh, or on Instagram. What you can do is if you do actually make any of these shapes, tag us in it. And next week, we'll do next Friday. By next Friday, the first person by next Friday that bakes a beautiful bread, um, we will choose and I'll send a copy of this sourdough book out to them, okay? There's going to, going to be one winner, but I'll send this is a beautiful book that actually is um, about a sourdough that's been blessed and travelled all around um, in Europe. It's part of the sourdough library. And so the winner will actually get a copy of this book sent out to them. But what you'll need to do is you'll need to actually either follow me on Instagram, tag me on Facebook, tag Fermented Home, somehow show us the bread that you've made and you'll be able to win this book. But I'm going to keep going, all right? I haven't finished with you guys yet. So I'm going to keep going. And please, by the end, also tell us which is the easiest uh, shape to uh, recreate. Because I feel that I'm going to waste a lot of flour um, trying to trying to recreate this. What I just showed you then, this one is really easy. This one is for me the easiest. So this one here is the one we just made. Okay. So this one's been fermenting. And someone asked a question, how long between it's Look, I can tell these are ready because when I touch them, my finger just stays in there, but it still comes out. If my finger goes in and it stays in and I can feel that it's, it's overproved, watch out, okay? The name of the book, okay? The name of the book is Sourdough, Four Days to Happiness. By Martina, I can never say her name, go on a man. She's actually a good friend of mine. I call her Martina, but I don't know, Four Days to Happiness. All right, so here I have the two breads. Now these ones are actually made with that black barley. So remember before, seems like ages ago, we were actually milling with the black barley. That's why these ones have that really nice color. I use the black barley inside, freshly milled. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stencil. Do you wanna go back to the, uh, the, the iPhone if it's possible, if it's still there? Yep, changing over. Okay, so now when you go here, what I want to do is I'm going to stencil these. And I'm going to show you guys a really fun stenciling technique. What you need to have is the uh, rye flour. I use malt. This is a special malt that I have here. Or you can use cocoa flour. If you have cocoa powder, you can also use that. All right, it's no problem for me. You can choose. I have my stencil here. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I put this on top. All right, then I'm gonna use first the um, wheat flour. So I put it on top. Then what I do is I just move it a little bit. See, I just moved a little bit and then I go over with the malt or the cocoa flour, cocoa flour, it's up to you. And then when I lift it off, you'll see it actually has a double design. So I'm gonna show you a bit closer. So first I do the white flour. This is a little Morgan trick that you guys are learning today. Then I move it just a little fraction and then I go over the top with the malt or the cacao flour, it's up to you. And you'll see when I bring it up nice and close that you have a double effect. Can you guys see that? Yeah? So now I'm gonna bake these ones. I'm also gonna bake these together. When I bake, I bake it around 220 degrees with steam. But as you can see, I have nice deck ovens here. At home, there's no problem. You can, of course, bake in your Dutch oven, of course, okay? 
Don't worry, I have one too because I bake at home as well. It's important to use steam if you've got a deck oven, of course, fantastic. When you use the, the crock pot, it creates the steam inside when you have the lid on top. All right. We've got time for one more? Yeah? Team? Go for it. Go for it? Okay, right. I'm going to show you guys one more. This one is a really special one. If you want to stick around, this is the one I'm going to show you how to make, yeah? Oh, that one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you guys how to make this one, yeah? So awesome. I did promise that I'd show you, so I better keep my word, yeah? All right. So what you're going to need is two pieces of dough. I have here one piece of dough that is 300 grams, one piece of dough that is 150, okay? You can do 400, 200, 300, 150, 500, 250. As long as one is bigger than the other, half the size of the other, you're fine. You'll notice I have two different colors in dough because one dough here is with the sprouted grains inside. So someone asked before about the sprouted grains. Paratas, we sell sprouted grains, ready to use sprouted grains, but only B2B. So if you own a bakery, be sure to contact me. I'm more than happy to talk to you all about sprouted grains. But you can always use the spent grains as well from the brewery, so don't forget. What we're gonna do is we are first gonna make this one into a batar. Okay, just like before, see how you rolled it down like this? Close, I use the back of my hand here. I close with the back of my hand. See, you've got that one, huh? That's simple, yeah? That one's okay. Then we want this one. We want this one to be just a bit bigger than that one, but flat. So this is where you need the rolling pin and you also need to have your bit of muscle power, yeah? So we're just gonna roll it out, like so. So mum, this one's for you to make when I come on the weekend, number. <laughs> I wanna see if she's paying attention. No, so here we go. So like I said, you have one here, which this is the one that was 300 grams. This is the one that was 150. This is where you're going to start using some olive oil. So olive oil is just in the middle. You just put it in the middle. Then you get this one and you put it upside down. So you want that seam, which I call the ugly side, the seam facing up. The two balls of dough be the same hydration. Yes, that's correct. You can use from the same dough. I just have one with grains and one without because I like to do things a little bit more complicated. <laughs> but you can use the same dough. So now I'm just going to seal it up. See how I'm just sealing it? A little bit like a Cornish pasty, I guess. Just sealing it. That's why you don't want olive oil all the way to the ends, just in the middle, because you still need to be able to seal it there. Turn it over. And now once you're here, what I also like to use is I have here a cloth, which is wet. This is with water on top. And I also have one here, which is with my seeds. Poppy seed, sesame seed, linseed, it's really up to you. You can use whatever seed you like. All right. So now first I'm gonna roll it in the water. Then I can choose the seeds I want. All right. I'm gonna choose the sesame seeds this time. Just gonna roll it around in the sesame. Make sure, make sure you cover all of it. Okay, and then once you finish that, we're gonna put it onto, onto a push. Okay, like so. So you pick it up and you put it onto the push and then you can prove that overnight. Of course, if it's sourdough, you can prove overnight or depending on how warm your house is. 
With the proving times, it depends on your where you are, your temperature. Uh, you can contact me and ask me personally for advice on that, but I don't want to give any generalization because it also depends on your sourdough as well and how much you use and your recipe and everything. So now I have this one, she's gonna go in the fridge ready for tomorrow. And I have some already ready. So these ones I prepared earlier for you. You've gone very quiet on me out there guys, you still with me? Yep, me too. All right, so I'm going to bake these ones up and then I'll show you. And we'll, we'll wrap it up. I just want to show you how to bake these up because it's a little bit different. When you have these ones, you have to see here when you're baking them off. I also did the same idea but round. All right, so that basically when you have the, the, um, this, this one here that we just made, you can make exactly the same shape, but just round, all right? So you make the middle round, the circle round, fold it in, and you have the same, it's the same concept. Thank you for the compliment, by the way. I was reading that, that was really nice. You made me smile. <laughs> so here, yet again, I'm gonna put a stencil on top, like so. All right, and now I'm gonna cut this one. You cut a bit differently. I cut down the middle like so. I also cut to the middle like this. I also cut to the middle like, I can leave like that. You can just leave it with four. Yes, you can prove these in a banneton, of course. You can prove them upside down in a banneton and turn around the other way, of course, yes. Now you can leave it four like this, or you can even go one more further. Yeah. And if you go one further, you actually can make something like this where you have all different, uh, you have six points. But I'm going to leave it at four for now. Make sure you cut through to the bottom. Now this one's a little bit more complicated on this side. So this one, you can just cut down the middle, no problem. We're going to make it a bit more complicated. You're going to do a zigzag, but never go past here. All right, otherwise it'll fall down. So you go across and then to the point and then across to the point, across to the point, across to the point, across to the point and here like so. So you see how I'm going like that and I do a zigzag and in the oven it's actually going to open up. All right, so there's that one. Now I have one more special one to show you. I'm not going to show you how. I do have a little bit of bread to bake, so if you stick with me, I'll just show you how I'm going to bake all this off. This one here is the same concept as what we made here, but I, I, you might have to invite me back for another session for this one. But I will show you a little bit of how I decorate it. We didn't have time today, so. But see, when you're stenciling, it's also you can get little leaves like this and see it comes up really nice on here like so. Hope I'm giving you guys some inspiration out there. Yeah, it looks so beautiful. <laughs> I look forward to seeing what you can do <laughs> at home. Uh, sure. Yeah, you'll, you'll, be you'll make something. <laughs> you'll be surprised. So see how I just put the leaf on there? You can even use leaves from your garden. Mm. Okay, yeah, that would be cool. Very nice, yeah. All right, so these ones I'm going to bake, and I actually do have one more. I feel like I'm on a game show or something, and I have one more. <laughs> and then there's more. Of course, there's always more. What would happen if you forgot to put the slits on top of the bread that you last showed? That's a, a question from... Uh, bread. So if I didn't cut bread. this bread here, it'll, it'll pop all different shapes and it won't open nicely. So don't forget. 
You have to cut it. If you don't cut it, it won't open. So see if I show you this, um, the finished one here, for example, see yeah. how it all okay. opens up? So yeah. if you don't cut it, it's not gonna open and it'll just take, you, the reason you cut the bread is to open the bread. You want the bread to open. You want the bread to open and have room to, to, to grow. You don't cut it. It doesn't, doesn't have, it's not very fair. <laughs> You're not giving it a very good chance at life. <laughs> that you need, you do need to always score your bread. So here I have two sourdoughs that I, um, just some simple ones guys. I'm gonna finish on a simple level for you as well. I'll probably take and measure a little bit crazy. <laughs> What are you doing? I'm getting hungry from watching all this bread. Make it funny, hungry. I'm getting hungry. Yeah, dinner time. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, for example, this one here, just like I said, you dust with the rye flour. It's better that you use the rye flour on top. Maybe you can ask me a couple of questions while I'm doing this if I missed a few questions on the way. Not too difficult ones because it's uh, quite late now. Mm. Think? I think you've addressed most of the questions, but we we'll still have a look. Yeah. Um, While I'm doing that, I'm just going to cut. So see how when I cut, I just make little incisions. And you can use any type of blade. I use. I have one here, which is a Paratus blade. But of course, you can use blades like this. It's really up to you. I think we got a question earlier regarding gluten-free sourdough. Do you have any experience? Uh, no, but you should contact a lady by the name of Yoke. She's uh, from uh, Wild Sourdough. If you search Wild Sourdough, she's a lady from Perth. She is the expert and she runs courses on gluten-free sourdough. Thank you. She's the master. It's called wildsourdough.com. You see, I did that simple cut here. What you can also do with this as well, if you want to get a little bit more exciting, you can even use your scissors again, and you can even cut around the outside, like so. I can see you guys doing this when, you, when you're baking next year. <laughs> this will exaggerate that, that leaf that I just made. See, like this? It exaggerates it, pops it out a bit. So here, yet again, I'll do it one more time. So see, I'm just going a little, like so, down. Again on this side. And you can even do it like this, so I just turn the bread around and I go the other way. Like so. So for people asking regarding uh, the recording, so this recording will be put on the uh, National Science Week YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, you can watch it back and uh, yeah, hopefully improve your own baking and uh, yeah. I'm gonna put these one here in the oven. This one in the oven with steam, of course. You can create steam in your home oven as well. There are many ways, look on our YouTube. You can use sauna rocks even, there's all different ways to create steam in the oven. Alrighty, so now I'm gonna conclude. As you said, you've asked me all the questions. There's nothing I've really missed. I don't think if there is, I'm really sorry. Can I please remind everybody to please go and check out this request for sourdough, register your sourdoughs. All the movies are on there as well, how-tos, um, a lot of information. You can contact myself and Carl. Like I said, you can ask me questions on Instagram. It's been really nice to be a part of National Science Week. I did make a little something for you. <laughs> oh, can we see it again? I'll send a picture to you guys later. <laughs> oh. That's so great. We can have a little bit of fun with you guys. That was awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So as I said, at Paratos, look, you, you can rely on us, okay? So 
even though today I showed you all sorts of things for home baking, um, and of course you may not have heard of paratas before because it's mainly for, for bakery ingredients, but look, we all have a passion for the baking community. And thanks for staying around a little bit longer. And thank you for all the thank yous out there, guys. Um, um, among all the thank yous is a question in um, French, I think. I think I answered it before. It was about uh, they, Right now, Fabio is asking a question. Yeah. I, I hope, I, I wish I could read it out. Uh, I'll have a look. Uh, everyone's coming. Everyone, thank you, everybody who's tuning in. Uh, my mood is contagious. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll have a look for the question. Hold on. Uh, uh, yeah. Do I use um, what 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 flour do I use? Uh, I use the rye flour. So uh, yeah, integral flour I use, and I sift it. Um, I think that was actually Spanish, not French, that one. <laughs> oh, tell the Sorry. Sorry for my ignorance. No, no, no yeah. problem. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, we yeah. posted the um, YouTube uh, channel link where this recording gets posted later in the chat. Uh, please check out the Quest for Star Wars website and Morgan's Instagram channel. Um, we post all links in the chat room. Otherwise, there will be... Uh, in the description of this video later as well. And yeah, thank you so much again. And Bye. good luck. Everybody. It was really nice to meet you all. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can always ask me. And uh, like, there was a, uh, like I said, log on to the quest. Go ask Carl some difficult questions as well. And uh, really nice and happy Science Week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you for joining. Bye. Good luck, Bye.